Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by State Farm Insurance. Keeping our promise of protection with auto, home, life, and health insurance. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Welcome back to the Woodwright Shop. I'm Roy Underhill. I guess you can tell we're not in North Carolina anymore. In fact, we are on Lopez Island, one of the San Juan Islands north of the Puget Sound, north of Seattle in the state of Washington in what is now the United States of America's Pacific Northwest Coast. It's a land of water, of course, land of the killer whale, uh, the seals, and the salmon. And here on the island, the Douglas fir, there the Pacific madrone, and of course, the western red cedar and then of course the people and they uh, the trees the people the water have combined to form a unique woodworking tradition we recognize instantly as that of the american pacific northwest coast behind me is a house a long house built in the quacutal style and one of their distinctive quacutal totem poles built in that again the quacutal style well traditions are formed of people materials and tools and we're going to meet an important player in this continuing unique American woodworking tradition today. Back about seven or eight years ago, I was down in Seattle at a folk festival, and I met a man selling Northwest Coast tools. Well, I bought an ads, and I bought a crooked knife, and I tell you, there's no tools like him. I want you to meet the man, because there's no man like him. Greg Blomberg, how you doing? Hi, Roy. All right, good to see you. Greg here has been... Uh, Oh, founder and operator of Kestrel Tool Company. He makes these things here. Northwest Coast tools, adzes like you see here, uh, carving slicks, and these wonderful crooked knives. Now, these are part of a woodworking tradition that includes famous things like this. Of course, the bent wood box you see here, uh, all out of one piece of wood. He's going to show us how he does this. Uh, this is one bent around board. And, of course, these carved bowls, uh, canoe-shaped bowls, because, of course, they're canoes that they built are shaped very much like this with the ends coming up. This all hollowed out on the inside and of course uh, the other work they do, the masks, all hollow work. And Greg, you're doing uh, something that'll be eventually be hollowed a little bit, a ladle there, is that right? Right. I'm carving it out of green alder. Yeah. Look at you go. This, it's working uh, fast. It goes pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. This, um, uh, the Northwest Coast people tended to carve uh, the wood green uh -huh. if they could. It made it easier to carve. And uh, you're using that edge. Boy, I see you got a swing over to the side there. It's got a lot of velocity to the, to the hit there. Yeah, right. Well, they're very effective uh, means of eliminating a lot of the excess wood that's in a wood carving. <laughs> this is, uh, like you showed on, the, uh, on those uh, canoe form bowls, mm -hmm. much of what a wood carving is, at least uh, in the Northwest Coast version, mm -hmm. is wasted away. You end up with a thin shell of wood. So they're, uh, they're shaped on the outside and hollowed out on the inside to end up a thin shell. And that helps keep them from checking, too, because what checking is is uh, the release of tension in the wood from uneven drying. Mm -hmm. So getting it thin and even all the way around helps it dry, well, evenly. Right. So right. it won't have to crack on it. Right. And again, I can see you work that thing across the grain. Well, that's uh, because of this uh, gutter form of this tool. Uh -huh. It allows you to work across the grain. And uh, it's one of the forms that these, al these adzes were uh, found in. The other one is a straight. And mm -hmm. uh, straight may be even more traditional, although uh, uh, a gutter form is not at all untraditional on the coast. Sure it's what I prefer to use for this roughing process. Mm -hmm. So just just shaping out the object. Now, eventually, this will be a very finely 
uh, finished ladle using other tools. Though. Right, right. But this one you can still go right down to the line with. What's the secret of the control that you've got with this thing? Well, what uh, the reason why these adzes are so good in terms of uh, being able to control them is the geometry. Mm -hmm. The geometry is correct, and that geometry is the angle between the cutting edge and your first finger. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it has to be correct to make it work. And uh, what's that? It looks like a right angle. The it's blade. a right angle. It's a it's a, a ninety degree angle there. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, that having that correct geometry, what that allows you to do hmm. is either hog with the tool or take fine little chips off, so you can work right up to your line safely. Gosh! And uh, and so that's uh, that's the advantage <laughs> of a of a uh, of an elbow adds. You can shave real fast with that thing if you really? wanted to. Good gosh! Really? All right. And that alder. Oh, what are the kind of woods that folks work with around here? Uh, alder. We don't have that. The big red cedars, I guess, too. Uh huh. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, this right. works works well in that. Pretty good, you bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're for. Now, this this is, of course, the kind that you make. What what what's the tradition on this? Do you have any? Uh, how, how do you know what the original tools look like? Well, we have a lot of historical examples, and uh, and I have a few little items here that uh, give us some uh, some clues as to what they were like. Oh. Well, look at these. Yeah. What you got? Well, this is a hammer stone, wow. and um, that uh, was uh, used to, as a hammer to hammer wedges mm -hmm. primarily into the wood. Is this a wedge here? That's a wedge. It's an antler wedge, mm -hmm. elk antler probably. And uh, they, uh, they would rive off boards and planks for their houses and use it to rive off the waste wood in a canoe carving or something like that. It's a big splitting, uh, red cedar, of course, splits real, real well. It splits pretty well, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd use a whole series of wedges, including wooden wedges and so forth. And make big, big planks for actually plank houses. You bet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Three inch thick planks, maybe. Wow. How about these? Now, those are adz blades. From uh, from old tools, and uh, these tools are found on Lopez. Although this uh, this particular piece is jadeite in your left hand there, uh -huh. and um, and so it probably came from Canada. It didn't come from here. But the interesting thing about those uh, blades is that the shape of those is largely uh, comparable to what I make today. There's no real difference, except I'm making them in iron. Uh, oh, all right, steel. all right. And they did, but they didn't have iron until much more later, I guess, in their careers. Yeah, they actually had it pretty early on this coast, um, and. Uh, where it came from is a matter of uh, conjecture, maybe trade from the Orient. They had it in the Orient um, some time ago, but there's a, there's a 500 year old site uh, out on the uh, coast uh, mm -hmm. at Ozette uh, where they found uh, the traces of I think 37 iron tools, and that's a 500 year old site. So it, wow. it, um, it really predated uh, Columbus until just recently. <laughs> Might have been meteoric or something. But how about how about this? This is uh, looks like a tooth of some kind here. Well, that's a beaver's tooth. <laughs> Okay. And that this uh, is an anthropomorphically uh, carved uh, or shaped piece of antler that uh, was made to fit that. And that fits that like that. That type of a thing. And it was wrapped on. Tie right? that in. All right. And then use it like this. Mm -hmm. And so that's the predecessor of the crooked knife, really. So you would work uh, backwards. So you're taking uh, one of the uh, beaver's tooth out. Uh -huh. and, a very uh, effective woodworking tool. Well, I guess that's how they cut down trees. You, you can bet, sure cu yeah. cut out a bowl with it. You right. bet. So, of course, this led to the crooked knife now. Could you show me how your crooked knives go? Okay. Because that'd be, I guess, in the finishing part of working on the ladle or something like that. You would use a uh, crooked knife to get, well, actually, you can use it all the way through the process. This uh, this particular knife is, uh, is my standard uh, bend uh, crooked knife, and it's, uh, uh, it's bent on like a French curve mm -hmm. in an ever increasing radius of curvature. And the advantage there is that this one tool re will replace a whole raft of gouges and things. In that tip section there where mm -hmm. it's really tight, mm -hmm. you can um, uh, cut off, you know, little yeah. you know, narrow uh, pieces of wood in a in a very tight fashion. As you work uh -huh. down the tool, you can uh, you can cut off uh, you know, bigger and uh, wider uh, pieces, wider radiuses. Mhm. Mm well, it replaces a whole set of gouges then. Yes, it can replace a set of gouges and a bunch of other tools as well. Using it. We're used to tools in the European tradition. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these tools are in the tradition of the Native Americans of the Northwest Coast. So these are, uh, this is the American tool tradition here. Ah, and we're not very familiar with it. the European, yeah. Yeah, we're not very familiar with it. In the European tradition, you'd take a, a, a set of gouges and chisels and so forth, and you'd have a mallet, and you would vice hold your work. 
and you would uh, then beat the tool into the wood and uh, or beat the wood <laughs> sounds, off or whatever. Sounds terrible when you describe it. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the way I feel about it. Uh, right. uh, somehow I'm just so hooked on this uh, method. But uh, but anyway, with this one tool, basically uh -huh. you could carve uh, an object like this inside and out. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a fairly refined uh, type of crooked knife. It's uh, the Northwest Coast uh, version rather than the Eastern Woodlands uh, knife or the the Eskimo knife. They were only carved so you could only cut on a pull stroke. Uh -huh. But this one is cut, it's, uh, it's sharpened on both sides so you can cut coming and going. Uh -huh. And so you can rarely ever cut yourself into a place you can't cut yourself back out of. <laughs> so you got to, if the grain's going the other way, you just right. push the other yes, way. Yes, that's right. Yeah, right. you don't have to turn your work around or work from the other side or anything. You can just uh, turn your tool, you know, cut the other direction. Now you have two variants of that. Let me get these here. I see you've got one that's extreme and one that's hardly looks crooked at all. Well, these uh, come in a whole variety, including l larger and smaller versions than what we see right here. But this, uh, this knife is a um, uh, one for hollowing. It's a mm -hmm. hollowing tool. So basically, it's for the back of masks and the inside of bowls and ah. so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's about what that tool is used for. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this uh, tool is what they call a not-so-crooked. <laughs> and, um, and so you can see it's not curved up on the tip. It's a, a, a low uh, curve in there. And, uh, and that's one you can detail with or do, uh, well, do actually, whittling kind of cuts and detailing cuts. I see. So you can define eyelid lines and things like that with it. In the, in the face. Well, now I've got another tool I'm intrigued about and I want to clear these guys out of the way and get you to show me how this one works because this is a D adds. Is that right? That's right. what it's called? That's a D adds. A D adds and I just can't see the advantage of it because you don't have that handle and the long swing, but maybe I'll understand it when you use it here. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's the favorite of some people, and it was a favorite tool among the southern Northwest Coast carvers, and uh, you can see it's very effective. It's got power. It's a real direct uh, uh, tool, but uh, it is a little bit different from the elbow ads for sure. But these things have one advantage insofar as we're once again we're working with a gutter form, mm -hmm, but correct, um, yeah. but uh, in the straight form you can both surface and uh, and waste wood, and so oh, it right. has uh, there's an advantage to them in that way. I guess it depends, of course, on the type of work you're doing. All oh, yes, the for product sure. and the for tools sure. are very. Yeah, if you close. want to reach up into the bow of a canoe, you can't do it maybe with an elbow adz, but you can get in there with a diads. And so ah. most of the carvers have a diads around and use it at least from time to time, if not, uh, you know, more exclusively. Huh. Well, that's what, well, a lot of, of course, the quality of the tools you make is in the forging and in the steel. I'd like to see if you could show me how that, that goes. Sure, you bet. I've got some going in the forge there. Let's go take a look. Oh, all right. That sounds excellent. After you, sir. Wow, nice machine. All right. Yeah, that's kind of a cute old machine. What's it's that? A, it's a trip hammer, a little giant. The uh, little power giant. Hammer. Yeah. What's this? Fifty from? pounder. What year would this be? Oh, probably uh, early 30s, uh, late 20s. Wow, that's great. So that's what we're going to use for the forging you now. You bet. Yeah, I used to use my right arm, but I've kind of tried to give that up a little bit. <laughs> All right. And you've got a gas furnace here too. Yeah, I convert it over from coal just like I convert it over from my arm. All right, does this work as well here? Well, it's clean. It's yeah. clean heat, and that's uh, that's one thing. I got tired of breathing the, the fumes of uh, coal, but it does have its problems. Uh, I found when I converted over that I was getting stress cracking as a result of the harshness of this heat versus coal. Well, better the iron stress crack than you stress crack. Well, so, uh, there you go. <laughs> oh, you better ready right. for that? All right, we got heat there now, All so right. maybe we should just pound some All of this right. out here. I'm ready to back off. Okay. Well, Looks good to me. That's about 1,600 right. degrees, so let's give her a wrap here. See how this goes. Here. Okay, so basically what I've done there is I've just spread that steel. That's what I was trying just to do. Spread it out spread to it the side. Out. Yeah. All right, that goes back in. All right, now what kind of steel is this you're using here? This is a plain high carbon tool steel, like huh. um, about a 1% carbon steel. 1084 is the technical term. Well, could you use, well, if you go through scrap, would that be like a leaf spring from a car or something You like could that? use this uh, for leaf spring stock, and you could use uh, most leaf springs for ads huh. making, too. I did. I made a bunch of them out of it. How would files work? I know people like to make tools out of files. Well, a uh, file's a little high carbon. It's like taking a 10-gauge after a dove or something. It's about 1.5% <laughs> carbon, so it's... 
tends to be brittle. It's harder to heat treat in a oh. home heat treat fashion. All right. So, you ready okay, now one? we're going to flatten one out. We've got, right. we've got a uh, spread there, so we're going to flatten it out. All right. And I'm ready. Little giant, do your thing. All right. <laughs> Yeah. So there we've got it flattened out there now. So uh, we're more in the shape to, to than an ads is. All right. And back again into the. Hey, you've got. Okay. You've got one already at that stage. Yeah. Right. So we'll just uh, cup that up. Yeah. We're going to put it into the swage block here and just uh, beat it around into that form that a gutter ads has. All right. Again, this just good cherry red hot. Okay. Watch and down to now. the swage block. All right. Okay. Just a little hammer there. Yeah, just right word, tapping it in here. A little tighter curve now, and then up to the anvil. Right, here's what's happening here is I am forming that into the... You're bending the, it upward, kind of yes, getting it cut right. there. I, I bent that up so that it's uh, in that shape that a gutter adds is. Huh. So it's got that drop in it. That's why I was bending it up as I was forging on it. So here's the final shape, I guess, is li like this, and wow, what a difference. Now, of course, uh, you've been, put in a lot of time polishing mm -hmm. and grinding right, right. and heat treating too. Right, that comes next after the grinding it to, uh, to form. So hold that edge, wow, it's fantastically beautiful. And then of course you got to put the handle on it too. Right, right. Well, let me stick this guy down here. <laughs> okay, here Sizzling go. me up there. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm ready. well let's go see some handles and, uh, and what we do with the tools. All right, and the angle of the handle. All right. All okay. right, I'll follow you. Well, here's my son, Raven, right yes. chopping away. Boy, you are good with that thing. Yeah. How what you making? A ladle. A ladle? I see you're roughing it out now. Is this what you make all the time? Make ladles? No. What else do you make? Well, lately I made this. Oh, that's mask. all finished. It's a bee mask. Yeah. What do you do? The bee? Do you have a lot of friends and do a bee dance? Yeah. Yeah, this is the kind of native mask. That's great. Wonderful. So you irritate everybody and go in the house and chase them around? Mm -hmm. You sting them? Well, Sometimes I don't watch out when I get them. But. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, that's all in the handle, though, now. How do you fit those things up, the halves on those uh, ads he's well, so good with there? Yeah, let's take a look here. Uh, what, I, uh, what I've got here, Roy, is a uh, uh, piece of cherry. Oh, okay. And you can see right here just how that uh, well, how that'd be hafted up there. Here's the this main the trunk, trunk of the tree. Right, and there's right. a branch. All right, so you've got the grain going continuous all the way around. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Got the grain Something working like for this. you. Now, this thing, of course, this has a, all thinned out here. What's the deal with that? Well, that's to give it some spring so it uh, can pop out a chip. It's a texturing ad. It's a special kind of ad. So. All right, so this is different than the one yeah, we've been using right now. Yeah, it's putting this texture on these, uh, these things that we've been working with. Can I see how it works? Sure, let's try it out. All right, yeah. let's see. I got a little piece of cedar here. Uh huh. And we're going to try it out and see if it'll texture. Yeah. Got a slight angle to the grain, I see. Uh huh. Right, you just kind of bounce it off the wood almost. Yeah, it does. It, it springs. So you go So you lay goes, down even lines like that. Goes in and comes out. So they're right. like in even courses. Right. Boy, that's great. Now you can see this uh, texture maybe better in uh, some of this uh, other work here. Oh, well, let's see. All right. As so you do it on a big, broad surface. Now this is these are again uh, the bent wood boxes. Right, right. All right. And this is this an old one here? This, that's an this old one, yeah. One here that's painted. And what do they use these for? Oh, just everything. Yeah, they store their food in it, and they uh, put their clothing and uh, personal huh. articles in it. A big chest like this could be used for uh, uh, storing the notes. materials for the winter ceremonials. Let's look let's, inside. All right, let's take a look here. Oh, all right, I can see the texturing down inside here. Boy, this is big enough to be buried in. Yeah, they did that too. They, really? Yeah, they made them uh, and used them for burial chests. You say you could actually cook in these things? Yeah, you could. They're, they can be made watertight easily. <laughs> That's something. What'd you do? Just put hot rocks down inside? Right, yeah. Ah, right. All right, boiling water. So how do you do that joint that gets the, to bend the things oh, around? Let's go take a look here. All right, let's see. All right, now this is a, this is a finished one here now. All right, so I guess there's one. You can see it's bent around. So you curved it, and that's the whole right. trick right there. Uh -huh. A special kind of curve that allows right. you to bend that around. All right, and that's where you're going to work. Let's see how you do this. Okay, so we'll just uh, try and put one in here. Okay. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to score this with the knife. Mm -hmm. Just make a couple of neat knife cuts down here. 
guess measurement is real critical. Well, it is if you want a square box, that's for sure. It's got to be pretty perfect. And if you want the curved, uh, the uh, corners come out right, the measurement's uh, critical in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, now so... Now what you got here? So, uh, so what I did there, um, what I did was... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, scored it with the knife and now I'm going to follow those score lines with this Japanese saw. It's a Japanese flooring saw and I, I put a stop, I mounted a stop on the mm -hmm. side of it so it would come right down to, yeah, uh, to that stop and that's my proper depth. All right. So now I'm going to put one on the other side. You just and got another saw with a different stop on it's it. It's a shallower cut here. Uh -huh. a shallower okay. cut. And again, this wood is cedar. Is this is right? red cedar that we're working with, right. Mm -hmm. Are there any other kinds of wood they would use for this? Oh, you could use lots of different kinds of wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of different woods will work. Any wood with a long fiber grain, spruce mm -hmm. or hemlock would probably work. Uh -huh. Alaska cedar. Uh -huh. So now I'm going to break out that, uh, that little piece here that we cut free okay. and right. get that out of the way and then undercut. This is a, I'm scoring the undercut with a, with a straight sure. knife right. here right down through Man. there. How do you know how deep to cut? Oh, I give it about three passes. And you just and know that from experience. Yeah, you don't want to go too deep or obviously your box will come apart. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to take the crooked knife and round out the bottom. Uh-huh. And again, here, how do you know how to... Well, see, I'm coming to the depth that I set up with that saw. So right. I can see that. Okay, so that and that's why I use stop. that. You could you could uh, forego the saw and just use a knife, and and some carvers do. They're just maybe better than me. <laughs> Something <laughs> that's easy. Yeah, so now I'm doing the undercut there uh, with the with on the bottom. Uh -huh. Okay, so we've got that cut free there basically, uh -huh. but we got to worry that out of there, that material out of there that we uh, we cut free, and that's the undercut, and that's what makes this thing uh, able to fold up on itself. So you just keep cutting, and there are other variations of this. I guess you can. Oh, there's lots of different curves. Curve, but again, this part has nothing to do except get that knife in there and kind of prime right, it. Right, right. Let's take a look at that um, that uh, sample board there. Right here. See. All right. Yeah. Now this is uh, you use this in teaching. Right. Yeah. It's a it's something that I can use there. Show the people what to do. All right. So you've got the two score lines, and then you have two saw marks. Two saws going down to the proper depth. You break out the wood. All right, and then you undercut, and I can very faintly see the, the sharp knife line, cut, yeah. knife cut going mm -hmm. in there. It's just got to be a sharp, thin knife. Round out the bottom, and then finally you undercut it right yes, here. Yes, right. All right. And then I guess thin a little bit on the back uh, right. to make it bend a little bit oh, better. Right, yeah. But I understand this radius right here is real important to support the wood as it bends. Right, That's right. It wants to be kind of tight. Thing. If it's tight, it helps. That's something. Well, have you got a piece ready to bend? I saw the steamer working. Okay, well, let's go see. I'd like to see. Here How this do. does here, and uh, this is again just uh, red cedar, red cedar, and it's all curved out. A little board that's all curved out. And the steamer's just a tin can with a stovepipe on top, right. so nothing Works much great. to that. Yeah. All right, tin can. At this point, I, I usually, uh, when I'm bending one of these, as a matter of fact, I always take time to um, thank the Great Spirit for this wonderful piece of grandmother cedar and ask for that it uh, it'll bend uh, into a sweet little box for me. That's. Uh, that's really important. So let's take it out of here and see if it'll be. All right. Well, I join okay. you in Get your request. Get ready to back off now. I shall. Okay. Here your it comes. Decks are clear. All right. You're already bending. Oh yeah. It's just, just you go from the time you start there. You can't let her go. It's tight. Wow. It's really tight. That's it. Boy, that came out good though. That's great. That's just what you wanted. Yeah, it came out good. You can see the corners there. How long do you want uh, something like this to have steamed to bend so well? Oh, about 20 minutes is oh, plenty cool. for this good red cedar like this. Oh, it just closed up like anything. That's right, great. Yeah. That's great. All right, so, I guess... And it's square, so I must have done a good job. <laughs> I think you did. Now, I see you've got in the upper corner a cur... Uh, what is that? A rabbit? It's rabbited out, right. A rabbited shoulder right here. Yeah, gra okay. grab that box now and you can see here. Oh, okay. See right there. here. How you fixed it in with the pegs. Right. All right. It's pegged together on the corner. And then we got to rabbit out a bottom board and peg that on too. All right, and just make it real, real tight. Right. Yeah, was, would this you have any kind of glue or resin put in there? Oh, uh, the Northwest Coast people probably didn't, mostly, although they could have used a hide glue or something like that. But uh, if it's going to be used around the water, it'll soften. That'll soften anyway. So ah. just made them tight. Just made them tight. Can I see that other box you've got there? You've got the carving on it. All right. Well, there's yeah, one there. now that uh, is what this box could turn into if you uh, worked at it. So it has incised carving, and again, the lid is hollowed. Everything's hollowed it's, out. Um, it's a wood carving in itself, that lid. Mm. Mm. And this carving, what style is this in? 
it's a northern uh, style, and uh, and like the, this big chest will eventually be painted and carved as well, and uh, and uh, and so that's carved in a, uh, like a northern style chest, mm. even though it's a tiny little thing. Well, marvelous, marvelous work. Could you show me? Well, take a look at these other items here. I guess right, you got to okay. hang on to the box, but you've got. Uh, uh, canoe that you've done here, and this is again in the uh, native style from this right, yeah. area. It's a it's a West Coast style, Nootkin style boat, mm -hmm. and the kayak as well. Uh, right. Well, it's uh, it's a Hooper Bay type kayak from uh, the Bering Straits. That's wonderful. Well, it's endless. It's just endless. And I thank you for showing so you much. You bet. To Thanks it. a lot, Roy. That's it's been a lot of fun. All right. You All take right, care. Okay. Now. Bye bye. Here on Lopez Island, on the Puget Sound, off Washington State, Greg Blomberg has found not just a beautiful place to live, but a really good way to make a living here. His tool making doesn't just take from the Native American tradition, it's become an integral part of its future. This is Roy Underhill, here in the Woodwright Shop. Thanks for joining me. So long. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by State Farm Insurance. Keeping our promise of protection with auto, home, life, and health insurance. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This is PBS. Please call 1-800-441-3000 to order the companion book, The Woodwright's Eclectic Workshop. It features step-by-step -step instructions, photographs, and measured drawings for many of the projects featured in this series. The price is $15.95 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready when you call.